back to The Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be looking at the cases of Alan Leppard and Brenda Long from 1991. Alan and Brenda were engaged to be married before tragedy struck and Alan was murdered on his own doorstep. This led to a national investigation into the mysterious crime. By the end of the year, Brenda had also died in very suspicious circumstances. Were the two connected? This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Moncton is a village in Thanet, in the county of Kent, in the southeast of the country. The village is located between the city of Canterbury and the town of Ramsgate, and would be classed as a traditional English village with a church, a pub and a school, all within walking distance. Moncton was also where Alan Leppard and Brenda Long decided to make their home in 1991. The couple had moved to the area together at the beginning of that year, and moved into a house just two doors down from the local pub, the White Stag. It's reported that the couple had not long since been together, however they were planning on getting married, and they were happy together. Brenda, who was 41, was divorced, and Alan, 43, was in the process of getting divorced from his third wife. The couple believed that they had found the perfect person for them, and they were looking forward to starting their life together. Brenda later explained to the show Crime Watch that they had both spent so long looking for the right person, and they thought they'd finally found them in each other. She said that Alan was a kind, gentle man who was not necessarily romantic in the usual sense of the word but never hid his feelings. Alan and Brenda enjoyed life in Moncton, and the pair would often be seen popping into the White Stag for a drink of an evening, and then making the short journey back home two doors down. April the 1st, 1991 was Easter Monday, and Alan and Brenda had decided to stay in that night instead of visiting the local pub or going out. They got into bed early and watched TV together, with Alan reportedly falling asleep. At around 10pm, Brenda was still awake, and it was at this time that she thought she heard something downstairs. It sounded like someone was knocking on the door. She checked the clock and then woke up Alan to tell him that she thought someone was there. Brenda agreed to go and look, and before going downstairs, she looked out of the bedroom window to see who it was. When she looked out, she noticed two people standing next to a big white car. Brenda wasn't sure who it could be and didn't recognise them, but went downstairs anyway to open the door to see what they wanted. When she got downstairs, however, the people had gone, and so had the car. Brenda went back upstairs and told Alan that they were gone, and whoever it was would come back if it was important. Around 40 to 45 minutes later, the pair were once again disturbed by knocking on the front door. This time Alan decided to get up, and he went to the window to see who it was. Alan confirmed that it looked like the same people she had described from just under an hour before, and he said he would go down to answer it. Brenda also followed him downstairs, and Alan reportedly asked them through the door who it was and what they wanted. When he got no reply, he decided to open the door and go outside. Brenda later told Crime Watch what she heard next. She explained that she heard a loud bang and a scream. She immediately went to go outside and went to the corner at the back of the house. It was at this point that she saw Alan coming round the corner. She said he was a grey colour, and she also said he must have moved his hands as he came towards her as she ended up covered in blood. At this point she started screaming and Alan told her to get inside the house. Alan was bleeding profusely from a wound in his chest, and it was evident that he had been shot. Brenda explained that she felt helpless as there was nothing she could do except call an ambulance. Alan unfortunately died in Brenda's arms that night. What had initially started out as a normal night in had turned into a brutal murder. Police attended the scene and were perplexed by the nature of the murder. It appeared that two people had turned up specifically to Alan and Brenda's home and shot Alan at point-blank range on his doorstep. Why had this happened? It had all the hallmarks of a contract killing, however Alan did not strike police as someone who would be the target of such an attack. He led a relatively quiet life working as a quantity surveyor, 
and had not lived in his home that long before the attack. Alan's body was quickly sent for a post-mortem, and it was later established that he had indeed been shot with a 12-bore shotgun. Brenda's account of what happened that night was particularly helpful, as not only was she there when he was shot, she had also got a look at the two people and the car that they had turned up in. Brenda began working with police to try and narrow down who these people were, and to figure out what they would want to kill Alan for. The village of Moncton was rattled by the shooting and could not believe that something like this could happen in their small community. It was a brazen crime, and one that did not seem to make much sense. Officers were dispatched to canvas the local area to see if any neighbours had seen or heard anything that night that might help the investigation. The local area was also searched thoroughly for anything or anyone suspicious. One of the closest witnesses to the crime was Alan and Brenda's next-door neighbour, Mark McGurk. He had not only heard the shot, but saw Alan after he had been shot and called emergency services. His account of the evening appeared to match Brenda's. He told the Dundee Courier, The first thing I knew about this was when I heard a loud bang like a car backfiring. I looked out of the window, I saw an old-style white Cadillac with huge fins. Then it sped off. He confirmed that he saw Brenda wearing her nightie, which had blood on it. She also had blood on her hands from where she'd been trying to help Alan. She told him that they had used a gun and that she didn't know who they were. He went into the lounge where Alan had made his way into and had been put into the recovery position. He stated, There was blood everywhere. He was soaked in blood and so was the carpet. He was obviously dying. He was grabbing for breath. Mr McGurk's statement clearly showed that Alan had been severely injured. Strangely, in the articles I can find, Brenda is referred to as Diane. However, it's apparent that it is Brenda that they are talking about, so I have assumed this was a mistake by the newspapers as the articles came very soon after the murder occurred. It soon became apparent to the police that although this murder had the features of a professional hit, the killers could have actually been quite amateur. Officers were able to find a large number of witnesses who had seen both the same people, and crucially the same car that Brenda described as being outside their home that night. The car had actually been spotted numerous times, and people had thought it stood out. The main reason for this was what the car looked like. The main description that was given by all the witnesses was that it was a big white American-style saloon car. This car was noticeable in the village as it was unusual and not many people had a car like it. Only a month after the murder, the police documented these witness sightings on an episode of Crime Watch in the hope that someone would recognise it from the description. The first sighting of the car that night came at around 8.30pm, just over two hours before the shooting took place. Claire Hodgson had been sitting watching TV in her living room when she heard what she thought sounded like a scuffle going on outside. She glanced out of the window to see two boys having what looked like an argument. Claire dismissed this, however as she was looking out of the window she noticed a car going by. The car caught her attention because it was an American-style car, and also because it was travelling very slowly down the street. She noticed that it continually drove up and down the street for the next couple of hours, and she remembered this because it struck her as odd. At a similar time to the first visit to Alan and Brenda's house, the car was spotted by two holidaymakers. They were staying at a nearby caravan park, and were walking just a few yards down the road from the couple's house. They also noticed a white car, and as they walked past they saw that there was just one person in the car, the driver. They got a good look at him on the way past, and later produced an e-fit for the police. They described him as in his late forties, around five feet seven inches tall, with light-coloured hair. Around twenty minutes later, another witness saw the car parked in the same place as the previous witnesses had described. He stated that he was leaving his girlfriend's house and noticed the car as it was parked in the spot he usually used when he went round to her home. He also described it as a big white American style car. As he got in his own vehicle and went to set off, he noticed that a man walked past the pub and then got in the car. This sighting is important as it actually confirms the car must have been from abroad, as the man got in the left hand side 
and then proceeded to drive off. The car was then not seen in the village for the next 25 minutes, before returning to Alan and Brenda's house. These witness sightings were crucial, as it appeared to piece together some sort of timeline. Whoever was in the car had clearly been scouting out the area for a while, before committing the murder, and due to this had been spotted many times. It also suggested that the killer or killers had a plan when coming to Moncton, and that the crime had been in some way premeditated. This also seemed to be confirmed by another witness that came forward. This sighting, however, was in some way chilling, as it occurred three weeks before the murder actually took place. The landlord of the White Stag pub explained that around three weeks prior he had been opening up the pub for the night. He said it was around 6.15pm and the pub was empty as he'd only just opened. He said that a man walked in and asked specifically for Mr Leppard. He questioned the landlord saying he'd been told that he drank in there and was he in there right now. The landlord told him that he wasn't and the man left. Like the holiday makers, the landlord was able to get a very good look at the man and help police make an effort of the person. He described him as being well-dressed and wearing a red tie. He had piercing eyes, black swept-back hair and a wide jaw. He was also wearing a gold bracelet on one wrist and a gold watch on the other. He stated that he believed he was between 35 and 38 years old. This was certainly an alarming interaction and suggested that Alan had been sought out in the weeks before the murder even occurred. The big problem in the case, however, was the question of why. The motive for this murder was not an easy one to pin down, and it seemed everyone who spoke to police about Alan were equally as shocked about what happened to him. On the Crime Watch episode, Detective Superintendent Nick Biddis was asked what he believed the motive might be. He explained they had a number of ideas, however nothing had yet been pinned down. He confirmed, however, that he believed Alan was an innocent victim, and that there was no evidence that he was involved with any criminal activity. He also explained that he believed the car in question was a large white or light-coloured American saloon car, however they were not sure about the make or model. He told the public that there had been another sighting of a similar car that night at around 11.10pm, in the village of Minster, just next to Moncton. The car had been spotted in the car park of a pub called the New Inn, and two men were seen getting in it. Detective Superintendent Biddis stated that he did not believe that this had anything to do with the murder, however he appealed to whoever owned it to come forward, so it could be eliminated from their inquiries. He also appealed to any scrapyards or scrap dealers to come forward if they had any information about a similar car that had been sold recently or had come into their possession. Another line of inquiry that police were checking into was the nearby caravan park. It's reported that there were around 300 caravans located there and that that Easter weekend had been very busy with tourists and visitors. Detective Superintendent Biddis explained they had managed to speak to most people who had been at the caravan park that weekend, however they had not yet been able to track down everyone. He appealed for anyone they had not spoken to to come forward so they could also be eliminated from inquiries. It appeared that the police were following many different lines of inquiry which could lead to new evidence, however every avenue seemed to lead to a dead end. It was reported that Alan's family were desperate for information about his murder and they put together a £5,000 reward for information that could lead to the killer or killers. Despite this large reward, information was not forthcoming, and over the next few months the leads did begin to dry up. The efits published also did not seem to jog anyone's memory, and sadly did not lead to any suspects. No motive seemed to be appearing as plausible, although newspapers did begin to speculate about Alan's love life, with the Sunday Mirror running a headline called For Wife Alan. This suggested that perhaps his former relationships had something to do with his death, despite there being no evidence to prove this. The headline focused on the fact that he had been married to his previous wife for only seven months before leaving her, and described him as a quiet Romeo. Alan's former wife Wendy was spoken to by the newspaper and she stated, Some people may think I was involved, but I wouldn't have wished him any harm. 
I'm devastated. This is quite obviously a classic example of tabloid journalism and speculation, as police have never openly made any connection to Alan's love life and the murder. Of course, due to the lack of evidence to the contrary, speculation will always appear, particularly in such a mysterious crime. Over the next few months, police continued to investigate Alan's murder with Brenda's help to narrow down suspects and provide additional information. It's reported that Brenda kept in close contact with the police and they regularly updated her on any new information. The whole experience must have been horrendous for her and she decided to move away from Moncton in the months afterwards. She moved to the town of Whitstable, located on the coast and around 15 miles away from Moncton. She lived in a flat on Cromwell Road in the centre of the town, close to the harbour. Brenda attempted to get on with her life despite the horrific events that she had witnessed that year, and by Christmas 1991 she was trying to get her life in order. On Christmas Day she saw her sister, and then spoke to her again the day after on Boxing Day. Witnesses later told police that they believe they also saw her on Boxing Day with a former boyfriend called Mr Hibbert, who Brenda had been with for 12 years before she met Alan. This would become known as the last sighting of Brenda. Over the next few days, nobody saw or spoke to her, and it was then that friends and family became worried. On the 28th of December, just two days later, Brenda was discovered in her flat. She was dead. The scene was both tragic and strange. She was found in her bathtub, which was filled with water. There was an empty packet of pills floating in the water along with a suicide note that had been placed close to the tub. On initial examination of the scene, it looks as though Brenda had committed suicide and left a note explaining why. While very sad, this could possibly have been a plausible explanation given the trauma that she'd been through. However, this would not be the conclusion of Brenda's case. Her body was sent to pathologist Dr Alexander Gibson for a post-mortem and he discovered something strange. When he received her body, he explained that he noticed an unusual chemical smell which he didn't normally come across. He decided to run some tests on Brenda's body to try and establish what the smell might be. The tests later confirmed his suspicions. It showed that she had diethyl ether in her system. Diethyl ether was toxic and would cause someone to pass out if it was inhaled. Dr Gibson also noted that she had bruising to her face, specifically over both sides of her nose, which matched the theory that a pad of some sort had been held over it. The police had not found any such pad at the scene, suggesting that she could not have applied it herself and then disposed of it. Brenda had not committed suicide. All evidence pointed to her being murdered. It's reported in Kent Online that Dr Gibson stated, Someone applied the ether to her face by means of a pad without consent. She had been drinking and it's likely that she lost consciousness very quickly, possibly in just a few seconds when the ether was administered. This was a deliberate and violent assault. The coroner Richard Stewart later ruled a verdict of unlawful killing and described Brenda's case as one of the strangest and most disturbing cases that I have dealt with in some time. This revelation was a huge shock. First Alan had been murdered, and now Brenda. Why had this happened? It was immediately clear to police that both murders had to be looked at as part of the same investigation. Detective Superintendent Biddis became part of Brenda's investigation as well, and later told the BBC, you cannot look at one case without looking at the other. It was clear that Brenda had been a large part of the investigation into Alan's murder and that she had information that could possibly lead to a possible conviction in the future. This would have been a significant motive for someone to want to get rid of such a threat. The sighting of Brenda with Mr Hibbert, the former boyfriend, was also looked into, however he denied having anything to do with her murder or aiding in her suicide. Nothing more has been published about this, which suggests that the police did not look much further into him as a suspect. The situation was so strange and the rumours that this had been a contract killing began to circulate. 
The police, however, refuted these theories, stating that there was no evidence that they had any association with criminal activity, that there was no proof to suggest that this was the motive. Without an apparent motive for Alan's murder or Brenda's, the cases became cold. Throughout the 90s, there was not much movement at all on either case, with the shocking crimes being left in the police files. In 2011, it was reported that the cases were going to be once again reviewed by a cold case inquiry team. The police put out another appeal for information and gave a statement about the progress of the case. Mr Dave Stevens from the cold case team told the BBC, 20 years on, we're still no closer to establishing a motive for either murder. We can't say definitively that the two deaths are linked, but there is every chance that there is a connection between the two. There was speculation at the time that this could have been a contract killing, but there is nothing to suggest that either Alan or Brenda had any involvement with criminality. Unsolved murders are never closed. Despite this new appeal, there has been nothing new published about the case since then. It does not appear that the new investigation has led to any new suspects. The cold case team did speak to Detective Superintendent Biddis, who had since retired. He explained how the case has affected him, particularly as he'd worked closely with Brenda before her murder. He told Kent Live, Brenda Long was a key witness to the Alan Leppard murder that Easter weekend. It has to be a pretty rare event where the senior investigating officer knows the murder victim. In the nine months after Alan's death, I regularly updated Brenda on the inquiry, and as a key witness to his murder, we had a duty of care to look after her welfare and safety. Did we ever have any reason to suspect her safety was at risk? No. Brenda was a very likeable, popular person. She was affable, and there wasn't an evil bone in her body. We had no reason to believe that either she or Alan were involved in any criminality whatsoever. They were just tragic victims. The whole raison d'etre for me being a police officer was that I could bring people to justice. It would give me immense satisfaction to know that the case might be solved. It's evident that everyone involved in these cases were affected by them. Alan and Brenda's murders were both shocking and unexpected, and it's believed to this day that they were both innocent victims of what was a mysterious set of events. So what do we know about what happened to Alan and Brenda? I personally don't think the cases can be looked at separately, and that Alan's murder must have had some connection to Brenda's. It's reported that the couple had no criminal connections. Therefore, it would have been unlikely that Brenda would have been murdered due to separate circumstances unrelated to Alan's murder. So it leaves us with the question, who murdered Alan? Police have ruled out a contract killing as the reason, and have stated that although it had the hallmarks of one, the perpetrators may well not have been as experienced as first thought. Could it have anything to do with Alan or Brenda's pasts? There is also no evidence to suggest that either. Another theory is that perhaps it was a case of mistaken identity, and that Brenda was killed to stop her from telling the police what she knew. This is also a little doubtful mainly because of the man asking for Alan by name at the pub three weeks earlier, and the fact that Brenda had already been speaking to the police for around eight months at the time of her murder. The other possibility could be that Brenda's murder was in no way connected to Alan's, and the motive was completely different. There are many theories, but barely any evidence to prove it either way. This is the unfortunate thing about this case, we simply don't know enough. These are shocking crimes, one happening on the doorstep and one in Brenda's home. It's something that you cannot even imagine, and the fact that both are still unsolved is even more alarming. Since 2011, there does not appear to have been any more progress made, and up until this recording, there has been no new announcements. I really do hope that evidence is found in the future, and police have stated that they are not ruling out being able to use DNA to help solve it implying that there is DNA evidence to test. This does provide me with some hope that Alan and Brenda's family and friends get some closure for their murders, and crucially, some answers. If you know anything about the murders of Alan Leppard and Brenda Long, please contact Kent Police on 101.
Thank you for listening to today's episode, and thank you to all of our patrons for your amazing support of the podcast. If you'd like to have a look at what we offer on there, including bonus episodes, ad-free, early access, and stickers and shout-outs, take a look at the link in the show notes. You can also support us by leaving us a review wherever you listen. Please do connect with me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, or you can send me case suggestions or questions to my email at theunseenpod at gmail.com. See you again for the next episode in two weeks. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.